What we're going to focus on during this essential hour will be um, this strange period of time that Jesus talked about, the days of Noah. Also could be called the return of the Nephilim. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Jesus gave us a confidential briefing on a second coming. Four disciples came to him uh, inquiring about his return. And he gave them an answer that's so important that it is recorded in three of the Gospels. He details all the preceding events, or many of them, that will occur prior to second coming. It's a two, like a two-chapter answer in Matthew. It's also recorded in Mark and Luke. Mark 13, Luke 21, following. Now, he opens and he closes that two-chapter briefing with a warning. He op first remarks, in effect, are saying, Take heed that no man deceive you. We talk a lot about end-time prophecy, but we sometimes uh, slough over the emphasis that Jesus placed in opening and closing this briefing. That deception is going to be the characteristic of that age. Deceit. We are in a warfare with Satan. And what is Satan's primary weapon? Deception. Let's keep that in focus as we go. Because what motivated Mark Eastman and I to undertake a book and research and these talks and what have you um, is the burden that we feel that there is a cosmic deception descending not just on the planet Earth but particularly on the body of Christ. And most Christians are not prepared for what's coming. Now Jesus in this briefing also made a very strange prediction. He said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, what did he mean by that? And this takes us then into this strange chapter, Genesis 6. And what makes this chapter difficult is that most Christians, even serious Christians, I believe have been mistaught about this chapter. So just do me a favor and try to approach this chapter with an open mind. Because for, let me point out the views I'm going to share, I've held for many years, but I've always regarded them as one of those things that's open to conjecture. Some people have this view, I haven't had this view, and so forth. That's fine. It's only recently I began to realize that, first of all, the alternative views are not really defendable, and I'll show you why. But more to the point, unless you understand Genesis 6, you will not understand much of the Old Testament, much of the New, and certainly have a pro prophetic blind spot. I'm going to show you a verse before we're all through today that many of us as prophecy teachers for many decades have read and taught and not looked at carefully. There's this, it's amazing how these verses that are so familiar to us sometimes will leap out at us with an insight that we've missed for a good part of our intellectual life. But let's go on. Genesis 6, verse 1 and 2, reads as follows. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things while I have this text on the screen. I want you to notice verse 1 and 2 are one sentence. That the daughters of men are the daughters that were born unto men in general. They weren't a subset. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that's men in general had daughters in general. You with me? Some people try to make, you'll see, I'll get into that later, that the daughters of men are a specific subset. There's no textual basis for that. But the real issue that should hit us between the eyes, what on earth is meant by the sons of God coming in uh, unto the daughters of men. The, what's translated in English Bible, sons of God, is in the Hebrew, Benaiha Elohim. Strange term, but here's the point. That term is used in the Old Testament exclusively of angels. Uh, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, 38, 7 being well-known examples. The term, while strange to our ears perhaps, the sons of God is a term for a lot, and we could spend all morning on why that term is so carefully and consistently used in the scripture for certain circumstances. 
You and I, in John, see, we're products of John chapter 1, verse 11. As many as it believed on him, he gave power to become the sons of God. Different issue. That's used of believers in the New Testament, never used of believers in the Old. There's an equivalent phrase in Luke 20, 36. Now, to corroborate this view, there was a book called the Book of Enoch. I'm not suggesting that it was inspired canon, but the point, it, point is the Book of Enoch, as it's known in history, was highly venerated by Jewish scholarship from about the second century BC till about the second century AD. And I'm not referencing it because it's correct. I'm referencing it because it demonstrates what the vocabulary and grammar conveyed. The word sons of God clearly from the book of Enoch were understood to mean angels. Let me give you a more authoritative example. The Old Testament was translated into Greek almost three centuries before Christ was born. The product of that translation effort is called the Septuagint. It is the version of the Old Testament that most of the quotes in the New Testament are taken from. So it's a highly authoritative translation. And it translates, Benai Elohim, as angels. So there's no way to escape the idea that the text implies, in fact expresses, uh, that angels, fallen angels obviously, came down and had some kind of communion, intercourse, with the women that were offsprings of Adam. That's what the text says. It's bizarre, it's uncomfortable to many, but that's what the text says. But let's go on. They came down to the daughters of Adam. The Hebrew says, Benoth Adam. It technically says the daughters of Adam. Not Cain, not some subset, the daughters of Adam. Now, in verse... Uh, uh, a subsequent verse here in verse 4 it goes on to say something else it says there were Nephilim, I'll come back to that word in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown this is a very strange verse the Nephilim, it's translated giants I'll explain why in your English Bible. But the word in the Hebrew is Nephilim. But while I got the verse here, I want you to notice a couple of things. The Nephilim were the results of this unnatural union. The, the, the angels had, had intercourse with women, and their offspring were the Nephilim. Don't confuse the Nephilim with the fallen angels. The fallen angels were the parents. The Nephilim were the offspring. Are we together? I want you to notice the offspring are males. There are children of them which became the mighty men. It doesn't speak of any mighty women. Now, I'm not being cute here. I'm not here. Uh, there's some issue reasons why I'm going to highlight this while it's in front of us, which were men, uh, were, uh, which were of old men of renown. The word Nephilim in the Hebrew means the fallen ones. It comes from a verb, nephal, which means to fall or be cast down, to fall away or desert. So Nephilim is a noun, a plural noun from the verb. It means the fallen ones. Also associated with it in that verse at the end, it says the Hagebarim, the mighty ones, the men of renown. When this was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, the word is gigantis. It was transliterated in our English Bible as giants. They did happen to be giants, but that's not what the word means. It comes from gigas, which means earthborn. So the Hebrew translators really said they were the fallen ones. The Greek translators call them the earthborn. You'll see why as we go forward. Now, as we go through Genesis chapter 6, it, of course, sets up this whole business of the flood. Genesis 6 is the prelude to the flood of Noah. And as you study the chapter carefully, you find some other strange remarks. In verse 9 of Genesis 6, it talks about the genealogy of Noah. These are the generations of Noah. We know what that means. That's a very common phrase in the Old Testament. Noah was a just man. doesn't say he was sinless. He was justified. We know later from other passages, he's justified by faith. Noah was a just man, and here's the strange remark, and perfect in his generations. 
And Noah walked with God. In the English, you don't pick up on this, but in the Hebrew, it's tamim. The word is used of physical blemishes. Tamim means without blemish, sound, healthful, without spot, unimpaired. Throughout the book of Leviticus, it's used of offerings. They had to be perfect, without blemish, right? Tamim. Well, what does this mean? Noah had an unblemished genealogy. As you begin to read Genesis 6 with open mind, what it portrays is that as men began to multiply, fallen angels came down and began to contaminate the purity of the human race with these Nephilim. And the Nephilim were the source of unusual violence. It became so corrupt that in verse 12 of that chapter, it'll say, it'll, it, he said, all flesh is corrupted this way upon the earth that God sends the flood to wipe it all out, except for Enoch, which is removed early, and then the eight that are preserved through the ark. Let me suggest another way of phrasing the problem. There was a gene pool problem in the human family tree that this is wiping out. Now, if this is true, the scripture says by a mouth of two or three witnesses, the thing is confirmed. If this view of Genesis 6 is correct, we ought to see it in the New Testament, and indeed we do in three places at least. In Jude chapter 6, Jude was, we believe, the Lord's brother, and he, he's talking about apostates, but he makes an interesting mark. He's pointing out that even the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude is making the point that these angels are set aside for special judgment. And what he's trying to say is if they're set aside, how much more will you? You see, that's what he's. But the point is, he makes a remark here which tells you some interesting things. These angels left their first estate. Uh, it kept not the first day, but left their habitation. I'm going to come back later to that word habitation because it has some interesting insights. And this somehow involved, just as Son of Gomorrah did, fornication going after strange flesh. Strange flesh. The word is heteros, not alos in the Greek, meaning flesh of a totally different kind. Second Peter. First Peter 3 also has a reference to keep it moving. I'll just take the one in Second Peter. Second Peter says, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and the word he uses, happened, that's the way it's translated in English, it happens to be Tartarus, I'll come back to that, and delivered them under change of darkness to be reserved in judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, and he goes on. Peter echoes the same thing that Jude says, but he adds a couple of insights. He ties it to the days of Noah. These are angels that sinned. Where are they now? They are in a special holding place. They're not in hell as we think of it. Neither Sheol nor Gehenna, something someplace else. A place that Peter calls Tartarus. The word Tartarus only appears here in the Greek New Testament. However, we know a lot about the word in the Greek vocabulary. The word Tartarus is a Greek term for a dark abode of woe. It's the pit of darkness of the unseen world. It shows up, for example, in Homer's Iliad, and it's described as being as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. This is not just a regular place. It's someplace really special. Now, I want to nail another alternative view down, because many people in this audience, probably, I will not ask for a show of hands, have been taught a different view of this passage. A very commonly taught view. And there are many outstanding, excellent authorities that happen to hold this view. But I, don't, I no longer believe it's very optional for us. Like many, There are many things in the scripture where good men can have different views. But I think it's important for you to consider yourself the viability of the lines of Seth view because unless... You go the other way. There are many other things that I don't think you'll be able to understand. Let me just let me just indulge me, if you will. The lines of Seth view is a view that this word "sons of God" really refers to the 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 faithful leadership of the Sethites. The daughters of Adam really refers to the daughters of Cain, and they were supposed to be separate. 
And the sin that's involved is their failure to maintain separation. There is no really good answer as to what the term Nephilim means by this view. That's sort of, frankly, that doesn't have a good response. But that's not, not elaborated, but that's the essence of the Asethite view, that, that uh, the, the sons of God really refers to the good guys, the leadership of the good guys, and they were supposed to stay separate from the Canaanites, but they married the Canaanite, the Can, excuse me, not Canaanites, the Canaanites, the daughters of Cain, and they married and, and had uh, offspring. Well, there's some problems with this. The text itself, the sons of God is never used of believers in the Old Testament. People who impute that view are bringing New Testament, misapplying New Testament passages. And by the way, Seth was not God and Cain was not Adam. And I'm, I'm not being cute here. I'm saying that's what, in effect, they're imputing to the text. And by the way, there's no mention of the daughters of Elohim. So you got some problems. But more important is that there is a grammatical antithesis between the sons of God, daughters of men. You see, the, the structure is clear. In fact, in Psalm 82, we also, it says, that ye, it says, ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. These antithesis is, shows up in the Old Testament several places. Also, the lie of Seth infers that there's a separation they are supposed to keep, but that's a fallacy because the lines of, separ of nations didn't get separated until Genesis 11. We're talking about Genesis 6. This concept of separation was imposed upon Isaac and following. Not beforehand. There's no text. There's no textual basis for that. And by the way, Ishmael was not told to be separate. Don't assume the Arabs today are descendants of Ishmael. We can't prove it. Why? Because Ishmael never kept separate. Small point, but I just thought if any Muslims here, I want, I, don't want, I want to have something to offend everyone. I don't want to play favorite. <laughs> but furthermore, Genesis 6, verse 12, indicts this view because it says all flesh is corrupted. It doesn't say that, that uh, you know, one particular group was the problem. The line of Seth also implies that, or infers, that the, that the, set, the line of Seth was godly. Only Enoch and Noah's eight were spared of the flood. There aren't any godly people there, except those, those nine. Also, the text says that the sons of God took wives of all whom they chose. You don't get the impression it was a participative choice. You get the impression they took wives. It doesn't sound like they're too godly in terms of the prayer. That may be pushing something. Why did the Sethites, if they're so godly, perish in the flood? That's, the, that's probably the real nail of that coffin. And by the way, Enosh, who is Seth's son, is the one that initiated defiance of God. Most people don't know this because there's a mistranslation in most of our Bibles. In Genesis 4.25, it doesn't say, then man began, began to call upon the name of the Lord, as the, as the English would render it. It really says, then man began, began to profane the name of the Lord in the tar Targum of Onkelos, the Targum of Jonathan, Kimshi, Rashi, other Jewish, uh, also Christian, Jerome, Maimonides in the, in the 12th century. The authorities that, if you really get in behind that verse, you'll discover that our English Bible has a misleading rendering of that. That in the days of Enosh is when apostasy began. And so it's a small point, but it, it does cloud the idea that the lines of Seth were good guys. The daughters of Cain, the implication of the Cainites are bad guys. Well, first of all, there's no basis for a subset of the daughters of Adam. That's, that's conjecture. The Canaanites were not necessarily godless. If you study Cain's genealogy, following Cain in Genesis chapter 4, you'll discover in verse 18, many of his descendants had the name of God in their names. We don't know, but if you're going to draw a conjecture, it's more likely that he, even though he was guilty of that sin with Abel, that he repented and he tried to raise his family God-fearing. Don't this idea that Sethites were good guys and the Canaanites, were, the Canaanites were bad guys is a contrivance of liberal scholarship, not of the text. And by the way, were the daughters of Seth so unattractive? I don't quite understand. <laughs> but the other issue is these unnatural offspring as a result of the union. What are these Nephilim? Now, they had supernatural offspring. Now, by the way, when a believer or an unbeliever gets married, they may have monsters, but they don't have, you know, a natural offspring. And uh, also it implies that there were no X chromosomes among the Sethites. There were no women of renown, only men of renown. 
And why was Noah's genealogy so distinctively highlighted in Genesis 6-9? Now, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, as I point out in Jude 6 and 7, 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20, and 2 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, even the unique term, use of the, the Greek term is fascinating. The New Testament seems to very clearly corroborate what I'll call the angel view of Genesis 6. So let me just summarize. We've got a problem with the text itself. We've got inferred separation, inferred godliness of Sethites, and uh, inferred Canaanite subset, unnatural offspring, New Testament confirmations. These are the major, in my mind, indictments of the so-called lines of Seth view, although it's held by many. But here's the thing that may surprise you. There's also post-flood events in the Old Testament and prophetic issues that you will be blind to if you adhere to the line of Seth view. Let's explore some of these. By the way, the angel view prior to the birth of Christ was in the traditional rabbinical literature, Book of Enoch, as I mentioned earlier, the testimony of the 12 patriarchs. It's, a, it's a, not a member of the canon, but it does describe the linguistic structure of that day. Josephus Flavius, Septuagint. The early church fathers, uh, Philo of Alexandria, Justin Martyr, Arrhenius, and the whole list, uh, held the angel view. The early church believed in angels. Then where did the line of Seth idea begin in the 5th century? Celsus and Julian the Apostate used the traditional belief in angels to attack Christianity. And Julius Africanus resorted to the Sethite theory as sort of a more comfortable explanation. They're uncomfortable with the angel idea. And understandably, as we look at that, it's pretty weird. Cyril of Alexander used the line of Seth to repudiate the orthodox projection. And here's the problem. Augustine picked it up. And uh, he embraced the Sethite theory, and it became the doctrine of the Catholic Church, and thus it still derives to the denominational churches, and it prevailed, of course, as the dominant view into the Middle Ages. Modern scholarship, as, and I just picked a few, Pember, DeHaan, McIntosh, Dillich, Gabling, Arthur Pink, Donald Gray Barnhouse, Henry Morris, Merrill Unger, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, of course, Hal Lindsey and Chuck Smith as more recent well-known examples are angel view people. If you've read Henry Morris's definitive uh, commentary on the book of Genesis, he, of course, uh, goes into all this for us. What's interesting also is that this idea is embodied in the traditions and the myths and legends of every ancient culture on the planet Earth. They have uh, echoes of the same idea in Samaria, in the Assyria, Egypt, Incas, Mayan, Gilgamesh, the Persia, Greece, in India, Bolivia, South Sea Islands, even the American Indians have the star beings. And, and I think Mark Eastman will cover a lot of this uh, this afternoon and give you some examples and stuff. But these, th this does not imply that the Genesis record are echoes of this. It's the other way around. Some people say, well, gee, Genesis also picks up these ideas. No, we got it backwards. Genesis records what happened. These are echoes of those same memories as embodied by a social tradition. Let's just take a look at the Greeks as an example. The Greek, we all have read about the titans of the Greek, ancient Greeks. They, these are creatures, their mythology has people that were partly terrestrial, partly celestial. They have the demigod, the gods came down and they seduced the women and, you know, Zeus had a whole list of these gals that he seduced and so forth. They rebelled against their father Uranus after a prolonged contest were defeated by Zeus and condemned to where? Tartarus, how interesting. I'm just speaking of vocabulary here, but I think it's interesting. The word titan in the Greek is shite in the Chaldean, and guess what it's in the Hebrew? That's kind of interesting, Satan, yeah. And of course, there's all kinds of renderings of Zeus in the uh, various classical, and, the, and Hercules and Atlas are Nephilim. They have parents that were part human and part gods in the mythology of the Greeks. How interesting in our class. Now we get into some other conjectures. These are conjectures, but I just to stimulate your thinking. Who built the Great Pyramid at Giza? No one's sure. Some people think it's pre-flood. These stones are too big. Even today, they're not sure how you'd build it. They couldn't build it without laser surveying. It's that accurate. Two hundredths of an inch spacing between these hundred ton stones. Try that sometime. There are discoveries I hear, reported, discoveries about the Great Pyramid that impact our understanding of the planet Mars and the face on Mars that will be apparently reported in the coming few weeks or months. I don't know, I just hear reports. The Stonehenge in Great Britain. Mathematics of it are closely related, strangely enough, to the Pyramid of Giza. What's going on? Who built these things? All kinds of conjectures. 
And of course, the face on planet Mars is the subject of all kinds of conjectures. And by the way, it doesn't take any imagination to recognize that discoveries about these things are going to give the New Agers a field day, for which the Christians are not equipped and prepared to discuss. If you go through history, you also discover there's skeletons of giants that have been reported in the ancient literature. And I won't go through all of these. There's 300 foot ones in the 14th century, 105 in, uh, but, but mentioned by Plutarch. Uh, 80 foot uh, Orion was 46 cubits in height, according to Pliny. Uh, who knows? Um, and it goes on and on. So these are, again, provocative possibilities that may at least suggest there were some strange creatures running around loose on the earth in the past. Let's shift a little bit and let's recap a little bit what we think we know about angels. We use that term very loosely. What do we know about angels from the Bible, the only authoritative source? It's interesting, they always appear in human form. At Sodom and, they're always in pairs, it seems, too, by the way. At Sodom and Gomorrah, they go down there and take care of things. It's kind of interesting, by the way, not to forget that in Sodom and Gomorrah, the homosexuals regarded them as prizes. I'm not going to get more graphic than that, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. They appear as pairs at the resurrection, in the tomb, and at the ascension, but always as men. They look like they're described not with wings as men. I'm not talking about cherubim, that's a special category. Now what do we know about angels? They spoke, they took men by the hand, they ate meals with them. Why? I have no idea, but they apparently did. You get the impression, especially from Genesis 18 and 19, you know, the Lord, Jesus, with the two of these angels, visited Abraham and had three measures of meal with him making the three measures meal a fellowship offering in the um, Jewish and Arab cultures. They go to Sodom and Gomorrah and they're mistaken as men by the homosexuals of the city. I mean, how much graphic do you have to get that they look... In fact, in the New Testament, in Hebrews 13, were alerted that many of you have entertained angels unawares. Now, it's the good guys because they're talking about being... It's, it's an admonition to hospitality. It doesn't say the bad guys are running around also unawares, but it doesn't say they're not. Who knows? Let's just be careful about the constraints we, in our minds, put upon these. Now, you don't mess around with these guys. One of them was accountable for the Passover, the death angel in the Passover of Egypt. Perhaps more to the point, in the Old Testament, we read where one of these angels, after dinner one night, slaughtered 185,000 of the Syrian army. You don't mess with angels. Now, we have an interesting assumption. Well, I should, first of all, we know they don't marry in heaven. These are the angels in heaven. doesn't talk about the others. But what causes a lot of confusion is that Jesus made a remark. It's recorded in several of the Gospels. Now, it's, the remark was addressed to the, res, the resurrection body of the believer. Jesus said, for in the resurrection they need people in heaven, neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Meaning what? That they don't marry. Why? Because there's no procreation necessary. Procreation, marriage and procreation was to present the extinction of the human race. Subject to death because of Adam's sin, etc. Okay. That's not the conditions prevalent in heaven. So they don't marry and procreate in heaven. But I think it's presumptuous on our part to impose technology constraints on angels that have chosen to do mischief. I wouldn't limit their technologies in any which way. I'd like to go back to this word habitation. In Jude 6, he uses a strange word. They, left their ha they kept not their first estate, but left their habitation. The word in the Greek is a wikaterion. It refers to the body as the dwelling place for the spirit. That's what the word means. It's interesting, it appears only twice in the Bible. It appears in Jude 6, it's that dwelling place from which the angels had disrobed. In 2 Corinthians 5, 2, it's used, the only other place, it alludes to the heavenly body with which believers long to be clothed. Here it is. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is in heaven, the same word used. 
So the same word is used of what the angels gave up to come down and cohabit with men, or women, and uh, the same word is what we aspired to go up to. You follow me? Interesting. Well, now we get to another issue. We're going to talk more this afternoon. Mark Eastman is going to talk a lot about these abductions. And this is probably the really hot button in recent years, is this issue of the abductions. There are a deluge of cases being reported that are too bizarre to accept, but they're too frequent and too consistent to ignore. These stories are all over the map, but they basically involve people who believe that they have been abducted by occupants of UFOs, had medical experiments done upon them, almost always involving the reproductive process. They have sperm or eggs harvested. They have fetuses implanted and then later harvested. Some of these people bear scars. The stories are very bizarre, and not all of them, about a third of them, do not involve regressive hypnosis. Jacques Vallée has made the remark in one of his publications, anyone that believes they've been abducted should not allow themselves to be hypnotized. I'll leave that as just a provocative thought. There are many churches that have people in the congregations that believe they've been abducted. I've made the remark from public platforms that I don't believe a Christian can be abducted. I'm probably wrong. I want to amend that and say they cannot be abducted against their will. If you're in Christ and you're really born again, one of the powers that's available to you, or I should say available to the Lord that indwells you, is over these creatures. They may try to bluff you, but you don't accept any invitations they extend. And you plead the blood of Christ to separate yourself from them, however attractive it might appear at the moment. Because you're playing with what we believe. We believe these things are demonic. Separate the hoaxes, separate the government disinformation, of which there's big funds for. The ones that are real, I believe, are demonic. By the way, how wide are these? There are estimates that go as high as 3% of the population of the United States believes they've been abducted. This is not a trivial issue. Major conferences at MIT. In fact, we had here in Roswell, John Mack himself made a presentation. Very interesting guy. There's probably no guy with better credentials in the psychiatric world. 150 articles in peer-reviewed journals, holder of a Pulitzer Prize of past efforts who has dealt with almost a hundred of these cases himself personally, has declared publicly that he believes these beings are real and that their agenda includes the development of a hybrid species. Do you see how that echoes at least? It seems, I say it's all apparently, it seems to echo Genesis 6 again. Are we moving into the, a time that could be characterized as similar to the days of Noah? Now, the implanting and harvesting of human fetuses appears to be a primary topic of these encounters. Something else that's a primary topic, not always, but frequently, is the debunking of the biblical view. Not the debunking of the Hindu view, not a debunking of the uh, fill-in-the-blank, always a debunking of the biblical view. They are adver adv adversaries to the, the, the biblical concepts. That's exciting. And the question that we have to con consider seriously are these are a repetition of the strange events of Genesis chapter 6. What about the origin of demons? We see in the New Testament, we use the word demonic rather broadly, but when we speak of a demon, we, most of us have in our minds the demon as portrayed in the New Testament. Very frequent occurrences, not a euphemism for psychiatric defects. These are sentient beings that recognize Jesus Christ's deity even before he announced it publicly. And you can go through, you study demons. They clearly, the Bible teaches that these are real. But they're always seeking embodiment. They apparently don't have the ability to materialize on their own, which means they're distinct from angels. Don't assume, we generally, in, in, in loose terms, think, well, gee, fallen angels, demons, they're all in the same bucket. In broad terms, maybe they are, but there seems to be a distinctive difference between what the Bible portrays as angels, which have at least about seven ranks portrayed in the scripture, cherubim being at the top and all that, and these demons. Now, question. This is, and I'm going to move into conjecture, but I'm just trying to stimulate your thinking here a little bit. 
What happened to the Nephilim in the days of Noah? They drowned, right? Okay, but they were half man, half angel, right? Angels are spirit beings. What happened to the spirits of the Nephilim? Nobody knows. It is a reasonable inference that possibly they are the disembodied spirits that we encounter in the New Testament as demons. Now in the Hebrew of Isaiah 26 verse 14, you do get the impression they're not eligible for resurrection. The Rephaim, which is a, euphem, is a synonym for the Nephilim, the Rephaim will not rise. Why are they ineligible for resurrection? Very simple suggestion. Jesus did not become a Nephilim and die for them. Now, what is also strange is the Nephilim didn't finish before the flood. There are post-flood Nephilim. I like the, in Genesis 6-4, it says there were Nephilim in the earth in those days, comma, and also after that, comma. Not much is said about them, but we do encounter them after the flood. When Moses sends the 12 spies to reconnoiter Canaan, and the 10 of them come back and say they're giants in the land. You know what the word in the Hebrew is? The Nephilim. We tend to think, well, they're just exaggerating, they're frightened. No, they were Nephilim in the land. They didn't want to mess with those guys. Throughout the Old Testament, you'll find certain tribes in Canaan, the Rephaim, the Emim, the Horim, and the Zamzumim, are expressly described as Nephilim, as giants. Arba, Anak and the seven sons, the Anakim, are encountered in Canaan in Numbers 13. Og, the king of Bashan, is the king of the giants in Deuteronomy 3 and Joshua 12. There are many of these. I'm just selecting a few. Remember Goliath. Remember David when he went across the brook to co confront Goliath, put five stones in his pocket. It only took one for Goliath. Why do you have the other four? Goliath had four brothers. David was ready for all four of them, all five of them. Gives you an insight of the kid then. You can look at your Bible from Genesis 3 to Revelation 12 and on as a war where Satan attempts to thwart the plan of God. As God incrementally reveals his plan of redemption, Satan is able to more focus his attack. We saw the corruption of Adam's line in Genesis 6 as one of his stratagems, having his fallen angels attempt to corrupt the line to avoid the presence of a... a See, the Redeemer, God's plan for redemption involved a perfect man fulfilling the requirements that Adam blew, that required a, a, a one without blemish, a man that's uncontaminated. And that was Satan's attempt to thwart that. Abraham's seed in Genesis 12 and 20 attacked the famine in Genesis 50. The destruction of the male line by Pharaoh in Exodus 1. Pharaoh's pursuit of the children of Israel in the Red Sea attempted to wipe out the Jews. Why? Satan's attempt. There's a humanistic side of it as we watch the tangible, as we watch Yul Brenner get ready to do that. But behind the scenes, we'll discover that there's a spiritual warfare going on. The population of um, Canaan, when God revealed in Genesis 12, verse 6 to Abraham that he was going to be destined to enter the promised land, Satan says, aha, uh -huh, I've got 400 years to fix that guy's clock. And he populates Canaan with the Nephilim. Unless you understand that, you have no ability to relate to the instructions God gives Joshua that of certain tribes to wipe out every man, woman, and child. You've got to be kidding. Why? Because it's a gene pool problem. And then as, uh, as God reveals it's going to be the house of David, the house of David is uniquely singled out for Satan's attack. And you can go through the whole history of the line of David and see these intrigues. Joram kills his brothers. The Arabians slew them all, except for Azariah. Athaliah uh, uh, kills all except Joash. Always there's a servant or something that hides one of the babies. Every time there's an attempt to wipe out the line, there, God, Satan tries to thwart, but God thwarts him. Han Haman's attempt in Esther in the days of Persia. Again, an example. Let me give you one of my favorites. In, the, in, the king, in David's line, in the line of Judah, the kings go from bad to worse until you get to Jeconiah. And God is so frustrated with Jeconiah, that he pronounces a blood curse on the line of Jeconiah. You find it in Jeremiah 22, verse 30. 
God says, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. I suspect that when, that, when God made that announcement, in the councils of Satan, they must have had a party. Maybe it was sort of like Roswell in the last few days. I don't know. <laughs> Why? Because Satan must have been convinced that God now, he had God over a barrel. Because the Messiah had to come from the house of David. House and lineage of David. But God just pronounced a curse. None, no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David. Gee, I thought the Messiah was going to sit on the throne of David. This is the royal line. It's got to be a successor. I think Satan thought, aha, we got him now. I always visualize God saying to the angels, watch this one. <laughs> Let's exa examine the genealogy of the Messiah. Matthew, being a Jew, of course, started with Abraham and takes it down through David. Abraham to David, you find the Matthew. When you get to Luke, Luke was a physician. He may have been Jewish, by the way, but his orientation is that of a Gentile background. And he was a doctor. And he was, present, he was interested in Jesus as the son of man. So he start, Luke starts his genealogy from Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan. We went through those ten to Noah. But then he continues with Shem and goes right on through till he gets to the father of Abraham. So he just starts a little earlier. He starts with Adam, where, Adam, where uh, Matthew starts with Abraham. But when Luke catches up with Matthew, the two are identical up till David, right? Well, let's take a look at what Matthew does from David. He goes, of course, because he's in the royal line. He goes from David to Solomon and down through the line of David, down through, and he ends up with Joseph, the legal father of Jesus Christ. Now, in that line, you see Jehoiakim, or Jeconiah, uh, who is the subject of the blood curse. Does it matter because Jesus is not of the blood of Joseph? What comes to the rescue here? The virgin birth. Because when Luke goes to David, he does a strange thing. He doesn't go through Solomon, the royal line, the heir apparent. He goes through the second surviving son of Bathsheba, Nathan. Not Nathan the prophet, Nathan the son. Goes down through his line, down through all these characters, and ends up with whom? With Mary. So Jesus was of the house and lineage of David, heir to the throne both ways. He's heir to the throne through the legal relationship with Joseph and his father. He's also heir to the throne. Now, by the way, there's another little footnote I'll just throw in. If you get to the Torah, you discover in the days of Moses, there was a guy that had five daughters. Zelophehad had, had five daughters, and he had no one to inherit. And when they were talking about inheritance in the law, he wanted his daughters to be able to inherit. So Moses goes to God, and God makes an exception for Zelophehad. If the woman has no issue and she marries within the tribe, she, the inheritance will continue. When you get to the days of Joshua, these five gals come to him and says, Moses promised. And he checked, and indeed they did, and so he makes that exception. Now, you can look at a hundred different commentaries that talk about the daughters of Zelophehad, and they all miss the point. Well, that's just a quaint tribal tradition, blah, 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 blah. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The claims, every detail in the Torah, every subtlety is relevant by design, there by design, and points to Jesus Christ. The, daughters of, the exceptions made for the daughters of Zelophehad is the thing that links Jesus Christ through Mary to the line of David, because she married within the tribe. How fascinating. Not one yacht or one tittle will pass from the law until all the people fill. Now we can go through this Satan stratagem thing right through the New Testament with Joseph's fears, Herod's attempts to kill the babes in Bethlehem when they try to throw them off a cliff in Na at Nazareth in Luke 4, the two storms on the sea. Those storms, by the way, remember when you read about the storms in the Gospels, the guys on the boat were experienced fishermen on those waters. They weren't landlubbers like you and I. They were seasoned guys. They were, four of them were in business partnership for fishing on that lake. And they were afraid of their lives. I suggest more than just a storm was going on because when Jesus, he says he rebuked the sea. Something deeper is going on, I suspect. And of course, the other thing is the cross. And all of this is summarized in Revelation 12. We'll take a look at that. But Satan's not through yet. Now, this whole warfare between Satan and the woman starts in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve fell, right? Right? Remember Eve ate the fruit? You know the story, right? Adam came home. It was one of you guys, you or I guys, I know how the conversation would have gone. 
boy, kid, are you in a lot of trouble. You've sinned. I'm still clothed with light. I'm okay. I'll pray for you. <laughs> Paul tells Timothy that Adam, he was deceived. Adam was not. He knew what he was doing. He loved her so much that he chose to be with her. To choose, to, he chose to share her future, come what may. Because he did, there were offspring through which the Redeemer came. I'm not, suggest, I'm not condoning what Adam did. I'm just pointing out the model that God presents. Because Adam gave himself for her. And by that gift, she lived. Do you love your wife that much, guys? Think about it. It's interesting that God uses the marriage all through the scripture to communicate his most intimate truths. God declares war on Satan in chapter 3, verse 15. God says, I'll put enmity, speaking to the serpent, up to the Nakash, the shining one, that later becomes the serpent. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Famous verse. This starts a chain of references of the Messiah. Three, over 300 of them fulfilled in his first coming. And for every one of those, there are seven unfulfilled for a second coming. But this leads to a conflict, a war that was declared not by Satan, but by God against Satan between two seeds. From that verse comes a title, a messianic title of the of Lord Jesus Christ, of the Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, of the King, the seed of the woman. That's a contradiction in grammar. It's a contradiction in biology. The seed is in the woman. I mean, excuse me, the seed is in the man, not in the woman. This is a hint of the virgin birth, birth back here in Genesis 3, confirmed in Isaiah 7, 14, and of course, in the New Testament. But everybody that studies this usually overlooks the fact that there's another seed talked about, the seed of the serpent. That involves not only the red dragon in the Revelation terms called Satan, it involves a coming world leader that many people believe are going to be on the scene in, in the coming years, and also a false prophet that causes the entire world to worship this leader. Now, this conflict and the angels representing those sides are active in the world today. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. What's going to happen between now and tonight is Dr. Mark Eastman is going to take you through the nature of UFOs and what we know about them, both reported and what we really know, what their message is, and what the New Age view of that is. And we'll return to the biblical perception of these things tonight. Are there UFOs in the prophecy? Luke 21, 26. Jesus warns us, men's hearts failing them for fear for, and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. What does that mean? And are you ready for that? Will you be surprised as that starts to happen? Let me remind you of the basic challenge I want to leave you with. We are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. And the question before you personally at this conference, how is all of this going to affect you and your family.